Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of Government in Transition. I am Michael Gordon and this program is brought to you especially by the People's Progressive Party Civic. I'm joined today by first attorney of law, Marcy Nadir Sharma, uh, economic advisor, Peter Ramsarup and Mr. Deodat Indar. Uh, I welcome you all to this program. Good Thank afternoon. You. Thanks for having us. Okay, I'll, I'll, begin, uh, with me, Michael. I'll begin first with uh, Marcy and we will deal specifically with the occurrences at the Ghana Elections Commission. Uh, what we have seen and what we continue to see mm -hmm. is uh, clear and unequivocal defiance of the chairman by the chief elections officer, Mr. Keith Lewinfield. From your legal, with your own legal mind, uh, what could possibly be the rationale behind Mr. Lowen Fields' open defiance and insubordination of the commission? Well, Michael, there's no legal explanation for Mr. Lowen Fields' rogue and unprofessional behavior. His blatant insistence to be um, insubordinate to the commission and to the instructions of Madam Chair is just plain, plainly and simply willful uh, he has no intentions of doing what he is required by law to do because he has a vested interest. And that vested interest is, of course, that he wants to see the party of his choice uh, be sworn in and declared the winner of the 2020 election. And there's no possible legal explanation I can give you or give anybody in, in the public to, to reasonably and rationally explain the man's defiance. And that is simply what it is. It's just this defiance and, and disrespect. And anybody who does that in any, it doesn't even have to be in a public, in a public capacity or in a government job. Basic businessmen and women will tell you that any employee who fails to perform an instruction or fails to act in accordance with the mandate given by your boss has two options. You either resign gracefully or you're fired. So there's no legal explanation to his wanton behavior. The realities are that Mr. Lowenfield has consistently in the last four months, and even before, I've always said, since the no confidence motion, when he said, um, oh, GCOM needs three months to get ready, then when um, after the president had said, oh, you know, I will only call elections after the no confidence motion um, when and until GCOM advises me as, it's, um, as to its capability and capacity and readiness to have the elections. And then when he did have that opportunity to speak, he said, well, I need three months from the date of registration. Then that goalpost kept changing and changing and changing. Synonymous really with the APN narrative. There's no other explanation. Well, I guess he's probably taken a cue from the, the manner with which uh, the, the incumbent has been changing the goalpost. That is uh, for his very great cause. I'm going to bring you in, uh, in there on this particular issue. Of course, notwithstanding the fact we are discussing the issue at GCOM, we are going to get to the issue of sanctions in a minute. But I just want us to reflect on the, uh, the recalcitrance of the chief elections officer. Uh, at the at the level of the commission, on mute yourself, dear that. Yes, go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Gordon. And thanks for having me. Um, now, you use the word recalcitrance just now, but for the common man who's listening, I will use the word bare face disrespect to the Guyanese people, and that is what he's been doing. There is no way that an election officer who is subject to the rules and the directives of the commission itself. Now, for those of our listeners and those who are viewing, for them to fully understand, the commission is a seven-member body, three from the government side, three from the opposition, opposition side, and the chair. Those seven persons direct and control criteria of which Mr. Lowenfield is a member. Mr. Lowenfield has to have been given four chances, four, to present a report and has failed to do so on every single occasion. When he provided the report, 
are a insult to the intelligence of the Guyanese people because the Guyanese people and the world at large saw for 35 days recount box by box, ballot by ballot, and they have a recount result that is stamped and certified by Mr. Lowen. His of recount. Those are the numbers that the entire world has recognized as a legitimate outcome of the March second elections. Mr. Lowenfield showed up yesterday without a report. When he do, when he actually does a report, Gordon, it's a falsified report. He first manufacture numbers and then he add numbers. The that if I may interrupt you. What's that? If if I may interrupt you, uh, we are you seem to be having some major internet issues. Your your contributions are almost inaudible. I don't know if the other panelists are are making out with what you're saying. Uh, I'm gonna let me I'm move to another to, location. I'm gonna come to Peter on this issue of the of Lowenfield's negligence. Well, Gordon, I think it's very obvious. You have one election, you had one set of ballots, one set of numbers from the SOP. For a man to come in and with those one set of numbers, as Indar was saying, give you four different reports with four different set of numbers, basically, you know, I can categorize him as a con artist because you cannot you know, make up numbers, you can't subtract numbers. There's one set of ballots that the, the Guyanese electorate went to vote. There are one set of SOPs, 2,300 plus SOPs that are being calculated and counted. The recount information uh, proved that. So for Mr. Lowenfield to continue to think that we, he can come in and lie to us that numbers are different, tells you that he has broken every uh, possibility of redeeming himself. So there's nothing else he can do now, but as Marcy said, be fired because he has shown incompetence. He has shown uh, activities that are fraudulent. And in any part of the world, in any part of or any organization, um, you wouldn't survive. You wouldn't even be disciplined. You would be fired. And that, that is my intention that he ought to have be relieved of his duty. He should not be given another chance. And the, the numbers are out there. The GCOM has the real numbers. The recount information is public information. So the Secretariat has enough of the data to give the, the rightful declaration that is needed for Guyana to move forward. Oh, the other I'm gonna come back on this particular issue. Uh, we seem to have had some technical difficulties this morning. Okay, Jordan. you hear me clearly now, Gordon? You hear me yeah, clearly? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, so I'm saying to you, I'm sorry, I'm sorry just now I was in some concrete wall, sorry. So uh, there's an election law of 2000. Section 18 of that law specifically says that the chief election officer is under the direction and control of the elections commission. 161 subsection A of the constitution also states that the election commission have, have responsibility for the secretariat. So for Mr. Lowenfield to come with four different version of one election result, I say again, it's an insult to the Guyanese people. Mr. Lowenfield is supposed to be fired. He's supposed to be fired. Now the chair and our general secretary said this yesterday, she's been lenient. She's given him a chance, another chance, another chance. But how long is the guy needs people to wait? We have already waited over four months. How long more are we to wait? When the country is going, a lot of our brothers and sisters Gordon are starving. They don't have jobs. They've been followed by their employers. And add that to the pandemic and the lockdown, the partial lockdown the government has put in place, a lot of businesses are not operating. People are at a breaking point. How long we allow one or two persons in the country to do this to us? We have to put a stop to it. We really have to put a stop to it. And this never ending cycle of election application that the people putting in the court is not helping us. It is just dragging us through the mud over and over again. Absolutely. Let me come to the issue at hand and I'm gonna begin with you. I'm gonna begin with you, Peter. Uh, this deals specifically with sanctions and more uh, specifically 
uh, the revocation of visas. I guess by now, all, all or if not most of Guyana would have seen in one way, shape or heard in one way, shape or form, the Secretary of State of the, UA, the United States, Mr. Mike Pompeo, uh, announced the commencement of visa restrictions on those individuals responsible for uh, not allowing the will of the people uh, in Guyana's most recent election. We are also receiving reports, at least one media has already reported that the UK, the United Kingdom has followed suit. Speak a bit to this, Peter, in the context of these individual uh, sanctions and also in the context of uh, perhaps sanctions to come holistically uh, as a poor nation as a Gordon, I will start out, I mean, our fun fundamental belief in democracy um, and the will of the people around the world. Please, if, if I may interrupt you, and I, I think it, the opportunity is right for me to say in clear and unequivocal language. Uh, I have just been informed by one of my colleagues that the PR machinery of APNU AFC has gone on air to announce to the Guyanese people that Guyanese and Bloc, all Guyanese are being affected by visa restrictions. I am saying so clearly and unequivocally, it is, a, it is a naked lie, it's a wicked lie. It is incorrect, it is not true. I'm sorry for interrupting you, Peter. Yeah, I mean, and that's, that's clear. I mean, the, the, the visa um, issue is not for all Guyanese. So there are thousands of Guyanese that have visas to go to the United States and will be allowed to go to the United States as long as um, we have a you know, good relationship with the U.S. But I wanted to get back to the fundamental issue, I mean, with the OAS and the Commonwealth and, and the United States and all the CARICOM, is the fundamental belief in, in our democracy and the will of the people. So one of the most uh, profound statements that the secretary said today, he said basically that the Granger government must step aside. And he was referring to that the will of the people, the recount data showed that the Granger government has lost. So the Granger government must step aside. In addition, he then added the fact about the visa uh, revocation of all the people that are involved in hindering democracy and stopping the will of the people from being exercised. And with that, you know, you if you look at the, the list, the list most likely would include cabinet members, it would include GCOM officials, even judiciary members uh, would be included, and financiers. Those are information that will probably come out over the next couple of days, but initial reports have shown potentially who those people are. And for family members is the next step. And the next step of the process of sanctions is if your visa is revoked and you're not allowed to participate in the U.S., in any things that the U.S. does, the assets, your bank accounts, and all other relationship you have with the United States will also be frozen. So it's an entire process that goes ahead with sanctions. But the Guyanese people have to understand that the U.S. has no intentions of sanctioning Guyana where the ordinary man suffer. They're not looking to punish Guyana. They're looking to punish the people that is affecting the will of our people and getting the election result uh, sorted out and a new president to be sworn in. And again, the most profound statement that the secretary made today is that the Granger government must step aside cause because they have lost an election. Michael, Mercy, if I could... Mercy, you seem very animated and wanted to contribute to this. I, I wanted to just interrupt a little and to say this. That, that narrative that you would have just explained or expressed is pure wickedness and consistent with AP and UAFC behavior. And, and you have to ask yourself, reasonable-minded persons watching this program or on the whole looking at what is um, trans unfolding in Guyana for the last four months, why, why would the U.S. want to sanction the regular man? There must be a logical, when somebody tells you something like that, you must ask yourself why. And the reality is the persons that are being subject to this, to these visa restrictions and revocations are the persons who have the most to gain or the most vested in holding on to power illegally and un unlawfully. And what they are doing is simply riling up their base. 
that, oh, who is America to come and tell us what to do? Who is America to come and tell us that we want to go to your country? We could do without your country. That is, not, that is not even, that is not the issue at hand. The issue at hand is the world has been saying repeatedly since March, not even the 3rd of March, but since essentially the 6th, 7th onwards of March, that the AP and UAFC should concede and step outside knowing that it is lost. If you don't believe you have lost, produce your SOPs. You didn't do that. You agreed to go to a recount. The recount shows that you lost, and yet you still mean to hold on to something that does not belong to you, that does not represent, as Peter said, the will of the people. And so I would really caution anyone listening, AP and U supporters, or anybody for that matter, listening to, to the nonsense that might be spewing from that camp, ask yourself why would the US or anyone else for that matter do something so silly and so drastic when they are not the ones who are engaging in unlawful and illegal acts. In that I'm going to bring you in on this issue. I know we've had programs before. Uh, I've had you on this program before and you explained at length uh, the processes of, of sanction and so on. I'll, I'll ask you to revisit that, especially in the context of what has been happening in the last 24 hours in this regard. Thank you very much. So Peter, Peter touched on it a little um, about the phases of how it, it, it come, come about. But a sanction regime, we must understand from the United States government, the United States is a very intelligent player. They have dealt with rogue nations before, since the dawn of the Republic. They have dealt with the Nazis, they've dealt with the military junta of Burma, they've dealt with the Russians at Crimea, they dealt with Venezuela next door, they dealt with Sudan, and a list of long countries, North Korea, all of them. They're all subject to US sanctions. Now, some have extreme versions of it. This, in this case, where Mike Pompeo came out this morning and warned that sanctions will befall Guyana, um, just to rebut the lies that they're saying is not Guyana. It is the people that are obstructing and undermining democracy, the declaration of the result, rigging of the numbers, falsified reports, contributing monies towards the effort. That is why the, the net, the sanctions net, goes toward financiers. It goes towards the police who are misusing their office and suppressing um, democracy. So it is a wide net that is scarce. This is the only, this is what we call the initial steps, Michael. The initial steps is revocation of visas for persons and immediate family members, as the, as the, uh, as the US Secretary of State just said. But the next steps of it will be things like freezing of assets. There are assets in um, the United States and uh, um, its territories. But we also have to watch the other countries. If the, if if the, the United Kingdom is going to come out, if the European bloc is going to come out, and if Canada is going to come out, with similar moves. Now, when it moves from uh, revocation of visas and freezing of assets, it's also move to um, the country, where the country start getting isolated, where wire transfers cannot take place, we cannot trade easily, we cannot export our goods or import from certain countries, especially the United States. It starts to affect you on a broader scale. Till, until then, then it will affect everyone in Guyana. We are not at that place yet. What is happening now is all of the rogue elements in the PNC um, camp and the AFC camp that are doing this, and in GCOM, those are the ones that are suffering. Those are the ones that they clearly said will be affected. Now, to look, if you want to understand it a little more, for those listeners and, and ones viewing the same, Michael, they can go to the U.S. Treasury Department. And the Treasury Department have an arm called the Office of Foreign Asset Control. And if you go there, you can check at two orders that the US president has issued as sanctions. Order 13692, that deals with the Crimea situation. And order 13880 deals with Venezuela. And it will tell you how sanctions are done and how it's fleshed out. And it will show you that people who contribute, even organizations that contribute towards a uh, government that is illegitimate and, and, and squatting in office and, 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 and has now become a dictator like Maduro next door and now Granger government, sanction hit them. 
people cannot even contribute money to them because they themselves will be caught in the sanction net. You cannot trade with them easily. So this thing here have a far way to go in terms of sanction. I hope it don't go so far. I hope the chairman decide to call this election as it is and, um, and get it over with. I know we have a court matter right now and it's and she doesn't act when there is a, a judicial process going on. But I'm sure as soon as this thing ends on Sunday, as the Chief Justice says, that she will declare this thing and save the country from this rot. Oh, I'm, and Peter, I want to begin with you first on, on the issue of not only as it relates to the sanction, but there continues to be attacks on individuals, institutions, organizations, and countries that speak out against the, the illegal acts of the Green Day administration to stymie and, and to suppress the will of the people and to hold on to, to government. But my question to you is in this context, and, I, and I'm also interested in hearing your take on this too, Marcy, and you too, David. It seems as though, and maybe I'm asking you to speculate here, on the assumption of government, on the assumption of office in 2015, there seems to have been a sinister and or diabolical plan that we will never ever under no circumstance relinquish government. Again, the PPP or any other party must never govern this country again. And you saw the events of today allows or act as a catalyst for you to understand the events of the past, such as the unilateral appointment of, of Justice Patterson to the chairmanship of GCOM, the, the strange appointment of Roxanne Myers as the deputy chief elections officer, and the list goes on, Peter. Well, I mean, I have to give the, the opposition party, you know, prior to this election, the PP and others credit for being vigilant in all these issues. I think your speculation may be correct. They went into power believing that they will stay in forever. What they forgot that the will of the people is stronger than any dictatorship around the world. And what the people proved in Guyana in, on March 2nd is that they, they voted them out for one, the you know the lack of the economics they, they took the country from a, a prosperous nation to one that in dark can describe best you know we, we our debt ratio is so high right now the bank of Guyana is almost empty you know the, the people are suffering so people voted out mr granger because he did not want fulfill his promises and he failed Guyana and so whatever they have attempted to do has been found out and you know, more and more we are seeing how they thought they could plan it, but they failed. Mr. Granger failed to steal the election. He failed to win an election, and now he's gonna he, he's got to get out of office. So I believe that 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 it will end and it will end right for the will of the people. Democracy always wins at the end. And for all Guyanese that are, are frustrated with this process. You must know that the end of all, democracy wins. The will of the people will win. Granger has lost the election. And no matter what Lowenfield or Harmon or any one of them tell, tell the people going, going forward after today, again, I, I repeat Secretary of State profound statement. And that's not just his statement. That is our statement. Every one of your guests, every one of the PPP leaders, every one of other uh, opposition party leaders have said, Mr. Granger must go. He has lost his election. And let's move on with getting our country forward, moving forward. And Dr. Irfan Ali sworn in as a president who believes in his inclusivity and believes in, in a president for all Guyana. And it's an exciting time. We're going to have the next five years. Let's get on and get on moving with it. Get Granger, get out. Marcy, this is your turn to indulge me in, in my speculation. I'll ask you to unmute yourself, oh, Marcy. Sorry, forgot. I um I gotta say that I I believe and I genuinely feel that your speculations are reasonable. And why would I say that? The factual evidence of what has occurred since the no confidence motion to present, and I have to go back to the no confidence motion because we are where we are because the, the wheels were put into motion when on the 21st of December, 
the, the motion passed. And every bit of conduct which would have been articulated thus far have been also suggest that there was no intention and there is no intention to leave office. And, and as recent as to in the last 48 hours or maybe or 72, where you had um, former minister Ramjitan saying that um, we won on a technicality and then followed by uh, Mr. Trotman's, um, well, so what if Mr. Lowenfield did something wrong? The commission can't stop him. They must declare whether it's wrong or right. So that, 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 those two statements in themselves are a demonstration of how well orchestrated the plan was and how devious the nature of the beast is, that they had no intention of coming out of, a free, out of office once voted out of a free and fair, at a free and fair election. And that is what we had. We had, and, and it has been repeated, this statement has been repeated numerous times in the last four months from the chairwoman to all international and local observers, to even the president himself had said that the elections were free and fair. Okay, so why is it now not free and fair when you are not getting the results when you want? And, you know, I got to say that the APNUAFC camp has a, one, has a way of twisting the narrative and has a way of taking um, wonderfully written judgments of the court and massaging it and misinterpreting in it just so that they can get political mileage and political gain, making the rest, making the rest of Guyana look weak and, and really and truly it is, um, it is distasteful, it leaves a very bitter taste in, on your tongue when you think about the levels and the lengths they are prepared to go. Michael, you there? You're muted, Michael. You're there, Michael? This, your thoughts on this issue, dear that. Yeah, so Michael, I believe that you're 100% correct. And it is called trade craft. If you look of the, at the appointment of the permanent secretaries in the country that Mr. Granger put up, you check their background. If you look at most of the organizations, if you look at most of the organizations that uh, run um, in a country like the hospital and other organizations, they're run by his military bodies, right? So all of them, um, he has set up, look at look at how we paid the office of the president in green. Look at the, the bus that they have, the Granger bus. All of those things are trade crap. Those are the same kind of thing Mr. Barnum had in the, in the early days when you start indoctrinating a nation to have one party kind of thing going on. That is not in a democracy. A democracy doesn't operate like that. Our democracy and the constitution every five years, you go to the polls and you ask the people, did I do a good job or did I not? And they will vote for you for, for you to stay in or you, or you to leave. But you're right, these guys decided to plant roots. They plant roots everywhere and uh, they didn't want to come out. Look at what they did. All of these appointments and all of these dragging along and these nonsensical arguments and, and, in, um, and false interpretation of legal, clear legal judgment. All of this is designed for them to just to kick the ball in the green field one more time, one more time. It's a never ending cycle of application that will end up in the court. They want to stay in power as long as they possibly can for all the nefarious reasons there are. So to your, your question, um, Michael, you are 100% correct and it is noticeable by the population. Just by looking around how they operate, it's noticeable by them. Um, by, by the smallest child can tell you that. So you're right, my brother. I agree with you. Michael Willa. Your reference to color brought something almost comical to mind. I, I take us down the, the, road, the road of imagining a Republican president being elected in the United States of America. And, and decides to paint the White House red, or a Democratic president tries to paint the White House blue. Uh, without a shadow of a doubt, that is what we had in Guyana over the past five years. It is that uh, we, we have stooped to those levels. Nevertheless, uh, we seem to be some steps in some way or the other closer to having the declaration of 
uh, Dr. Muhammad Irfan Ali uh, declared and sworn in as president of the Republic of Guyana. However, Guyana is at an important crossroad. And if I may indulge you on this issue of the disputed trust of this country in the context of the economic, social, and uh, international relation damage that has been done, uh, especially since the passage of the no confidence motion and intensified after the March 2nd, 2020 elections. I'm going to begin with you, Marcy. Guyana cannot exist in isolation of the rest of the world. That, that is a fundamental truth that no one can deny and close your eyes and pretend that it does not exist. Guyana, in all of its, its glory, has um, a significant lack of resources, both intellectually and infrastructurally. And we have always had to rely on our international partners, our regional brothers and sisters, and our own citizens to essentially do what is um, considered on a global scale to be cooperation and working in the best interests of humanity. And these elections should not change that. And what you have seen is a very blatant effort to change our standing in the, and has changed our standing really um, in the world. And, and so moving forward, again, economically, socially, um, we just need to be able to say with a very mature and responsible um, outlook that governments come, governments go. We are elected, we are ousted from office, but the business of Guyana and me keeping Guyana a, a viable partner in the world is still the utmost aim for all of us. And more so now, I think there's a general belief that, oh, it doesn't matter what we do because we have oil, um, the international powers will come and play heat because they will need us. That is not so. The world needed Venezuela's oil too. And that didn't quite turn out the way it did who who got hurt as a result of of the the left socialist behavior in venezuela it wasn't the government officials it was the ordinary man and woman on the street who could not afford to go and buy anything to eat and in fact there's nothing in it because in the stores because the sanctions are in play and Venezuela is a, just a clear demonstration of what our future could look like if we continue to isolate and alienate ourselves from the rest of the world. I'm going to bring you in on this issue, audio that uh, the issue of Guyana's forward trajectory in the context of all that has happened over the last uh, 20 months or thereabouts. Yeah, so Michael is a very important question because these people in the PNC and the AFC, I call them PNC and AFC because there's no APNU anymore. All of them small parties, it's just a couple of people. I know there's an AFC. Uh, yeah, that's a defunct one too. Let's, just let's just say PNC and, and call it John. Just PNC. So these guys in the PNC, right, they have done significant harm to the image and repetition of the Guyanese people. They have... They have two guys on a show. They call them Lampy or Pampy or we got a button a Costello or something. I call them Brick and Lace. They whole day, every day, they will go and they say cost the international community. Then they have the leaders above them doing the same thing. Now, the international community, every country have this, this world, we operate on the information highway. Information flows fast. And they could tell the difference between right and wrong. Sorry about that. They could tell the difference between right and wrong. They can tell the difference when persons are lying and when they're telling the truth. Guyana, under the leadership of Dr. Irfan Ali, will see prosperity because he believes in song management. He don't believe in the kind of things you see with the Granger government, how they rape the treasury, the bank of the country. That is not the kind of philosophy um, that Dr. Ali has. Right, it's taught his economic outlook and philosophy is totally different from what Granger has. And I, and I guess that is what the people of Guyana saw, and that is why they voted for him overwhelmingly at the elections. But to move forward, that to take that philosophy and translate it into action, he has surrounded himself with a lot of professional, a lot of professional people, people from all walks of society, all races in society, are part of the Irfan Ali's team 
right? So to go forward, you have right now you haven't had one of them. But talking international community of the Caribbean leaders, not one in on a if an Ali's camp on his leadership, not one person. But on the other side, you have everyone that is quarreling with the international community. Look at tomorrow. I would suspect tomorrow they will have something to curse the Americans because of the sanctions um, on the visa today. They'll curse the Americans again, and they will continue to, and that is how dictators operate. They get worse and worse, and they grip tighter and tighter until you get the, that final push to get them up, right? So although we have been hurt by their, their, their actions and some of what they said about leaders, like how they cost them uh, Prime Minister Motley. Although we are hurt by it, I believe that we can repair it with a fresh set of faiths, new thinking, and a better approach to international relations. Peter, your view, your view on this issue, uh, and I'm gonna, in closing, I'm also, while you express your view on the forward trajectory of Gan in your own, in your own view, I'm, I'm also going to ask you about the vulgarity of a state funeral for the chairman of the Ghana Elections Commission by supporters of the AFNUN. Where does sanity leadership, decency, I'm going to use the word decency, and, and, and right thinking come into play by the leadership to say to the supporters on the ground, listen, you stop that. This is not good. It, it's ugly. It's vulgar. It's wrong. Peter? I'll start with that first, Michael, and come back to um, endorsing what Indar Marcia said. Yes, for to allow your supporters to deframe, uh, you know, a senior public official in our nation, right here in our country, and that talks about them doing it outside of Guyana, but for them to to have a coffin with a doll inside and call it Claudette Singh. You know, she's the chairman of an independent commission. She has done her job as efficient as she can, uh, sometimes a little lenient as we may say, but she is there to ensure that the process and the will of the people is exercised. And for Mr. Granger, not to come out and when some of those incidents happen right outside of state house he probably drove past the coffin and yet has come out to condemn his supporters from exercising such um you know for lack of a better term craziness and 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 you know to admonish them for what they have done but i want to get back to 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 your initial question about rebuilding our our image i'm very confident that after your finale will be able to rebuild our image rapidly. And one, because the fundamental issue that we're dealing with our, our, our friends around the world that have come to our support is the fundamental belief in democracy. And the PPP as a party and the ideology and their administration believes 100% in democracy and the will of the people. In, in, in the years that they have been in, in, in office in Guyana, that is something that they have, they have never trampled on. So Dr. Ali, I have the confidence that we'll rapidly be able to repair that damage that APNO has done to our nation. He, as Indar said, our, our economic plan, you know, an integrated economic plan that looks at, you know, our future uh, resources and our today resources is ready to be implemented. You know, he talks about inclusive gov governance. He talks about, you know, managing across the nation for every Guyanese to benefit. And that's something exciting we have to look forward to. And no, no leader in the world will condemn us for putting that image first, putting Guyana, our people, uh, to benefit from our policies and for our deliverables. And as a result-oriented president, we will be one of those countries that people will look forward to come to. And I really believe Guyana is on an exciting path as soon as Dr. Irfan Ali takes the leadership. And as, 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 as Indar said, the, the team that he has assembled around him will ensure that they are result-oriented and his commitment to inclusivity and his commitment to ensure every single Guyanese benefit is commendable, and I believe he will deliver on those commitments. Not a promise; it's a commitment that Dr. Ali has made. Yeah, that your your point, and I'm also ask you to also ask you to bring into question or, or bring into focus the issue of the doll in the coffin referred to as Claudette Singh yesterday, uh, the nakedness and the, the vulgar nature of it, and and the failure. I also have to ask you about the 
the party, the failure of the party's leadership, APNU FC's leadership. So to call it out for what it is. Do that, do that. I heard the first part of the question, which is about the, um, the coffin that they had with Justice Singh. Um, so let me address that, right? You know, you don't call dead on people, you know. You don't do that, you know. You know, so... ...to you. So to see... We seem to be having some, some technical issues with... Yeah, maybe maybe again. Peter, maybe um Nadia or that could go go ahead before before me. I'll come back in. I'm gonna put this question to you, Marcy, uh, and I'm gonna ask you from the standpoint, first and foremost, of being a woman, mm -hmm. and, and 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 secondly, the issue of leadership and whether leadership has is really leadership to the point that you could call into question such acts by your supporters. Look, what happened yesterday with that coffin scenario really brought a lot of memories to me having lived through the 1997 elections and the effigies and the burnings and the, and, um, ex the, the exuberance with which freedom of expression is practiced by um, the AP and UAFC supporters when they feel that they are braced, they're pushed against the corner. And I, and I, I appreciate that everyone needs to be able to articulate themselves, but you know, there is a balance that needs to be struck between defending your party or supporting your party, or calling for your parties um, being sworn in, whether illegally or on or or not. Um, there's a balance between intimidating public officers in the course of freely expressing yourself the way that. Um, persons did yesterday and I saw one of the supporters went live and tried to explain um, tried to offer an, a reasonable explanation as to why it was okay for a coffin to be dragged down the road calling for Madam Chair's life to be placed in a hinge and, and there is no place for such behavior in all honesty in a democracy in the 21st century leadership by the AP and UAFC needed to be able to say look I understand um, you, 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 our supporters, I understand you are upset and that you want to see certain actions, but we call on you to act responsibly, reasonably, and within the confines of the law. Because at the end of the day, you are a reflection of, of us. And we saw that lacking. That did not come out. As a woman, I, I, I have to say, it is, it is scary to think that every time... Uh, a, a public officer such as Madam Chair does something that you are not in keeping, you believe it is okay and that a, a woman officer might be feeble and weak-minded to think that it's okay and you can int intimidate them to, do, to bend to your will. And that's not going to happen. We have our Madam Chair has been extremely patient as Peter said, very lenient at some times, but her decisions have also been very erudite and supported by the CCJ. When the CCJ said that the chairman was very, is correct in her assessment that GCOM does not have the capacity to invalidate or the authority to invalidate votes and must use the figures of the recount process to declare the winner, you can't want anything stronger than that. And no amount of, of behavior like we saw yesterday will change that. Dear that, I'm going to bring you back in on this issue of yesterday's. Thank authority. you very much. Thank you very much. You can hear me clearly now. So, yeah. you, you know, to, you don't call dead on people, as I said earlier. You don't call dead on people. You calling dead on people, it, it comes back to you. So, those people who have her in a coffin and trying to do all kind of uh, mumbo jumbo around it, I mean, I would expect the religious community to come out and say something about that, apart from the, the um, political masters. Their political masters, I, I, I wouldn't say, they will not come out, Marcy, and tell and, and, and condemn that behavior because right now they're in the court trying to get the court to, to, to um, allow for Mingo Ringen. They want the court to adopt Mingo Ringen. So there's no dignity in them anymore, I, in, in my view. They have all lost that element of dignity and integrity. 
What you have now is some empty shells running around the place, um, holding on to a rope that is cutting their hands going down the road. But, but those kind of behavior, it doesn't belong in our society. It should be stamped out. It is tasteless, and we should all reject them, right? That is, it's not behavior for the for our country. That's not what we want to show our children, Gordon. No, none of us want to teach our children those kind of behavior, right? So I, I, I really don't agree with that. I really, I was upset when I saw it too. Thank you. Dear that end our Marcy Nadir Sharma, Peter Ramsaro. It has been a pleasure having you on this program. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much, sir. And thank you for um, very much for the listeners and your viewers. Thank you. And I'd like to thank the listeners and viewers for joining us. This has been Government in Transition, a special program brought to you by the People's Progressive Party. My colleague, you thought, will be on at 4 p.m. Uh, please tune in again uh, for more updates, compliments of the PPPC. <laughs>